Greetings again in Jesus, our Saviour's name. And welcome to another Glad Tidings, our program. My name is Eric Stewart. And it's a joy and privilege again to share with you on our program today. We're going to open up with a great hymn, well known, and uh, you will be able to sing along perhaps with the singers today. We're going to have the hymn, Count Your Blessings. The Bible tells us that every day the Lord loads us with blessings and benefits and that we are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. But there are many temporal blessings that we enjoy in our lives as well. And let's enjoy the hymn as we reflect on the blessings of the Lord on our lives. Count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord hath done. when you sing a song like that or listen to a song like that, it does lift your spirit. And uh, today we need something to give us a spiritual uplift and what better song than something like this. And we always enjoy these beautiful messages that we put onto our programs and we trust that you will enjoy them also. Now, our ministry is not just about being personally blessed, but it's about blessing others as well. And that's why the Lord Jesus said to lift up our eyes and look on the fields. They're white already to harvest. And don't be saying, well, there's still four months and then comes the harvest. The harvest is right there to be reaped and won for the Lord Jesus Christ. And what are we speaking about? We're speaking about the winning of men and women and young people for the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, to do that, he needs messengers and he needs people to tell others about himself. And he has no hands but our hands, and no feet but our feet, and no tongues but our tongues to tell men how he died. So we're going to let you listen to a quartet uh, from many years ago here in Northern Ireland, Crimson River Quartet, and they're singing a song, Telling the World. And after we listen to this song, then Yvonne, my wife, is going to come and share with you a remarkable story that we've been enjoying preparing for you. So right after this, Yvonne is coming on the program. In sin I wandered, talents I squandered, 
did not keep my brother in whom I meet. Then Jesus found me from sin on bond me. Now I'm telling the world about his love. I love to sing, sing about a, 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 our King, wonderful King, and to make his praises his glad. Praises to ring. Glad is to ring. He gave his life. From sin might be made free. I'm happy to say. I am glad to say. I'm on the right way. I am on the way. That leads from nature night. from that night. To perfect day. On to perfect day. It's joy to know. Only I know. His friend above. Jesus above. That's why I'm telling the world about his love. Brother, trusting his work with saints and sages through endless ages, we will tell the whole world about his love. I love to sing, sing about a, a, our a King, wonderful King, and to make his praises make his glad. Praises to ring. Glad is to ring. He gave his life, gave his life on Calvary. That we from sin might be made free. I'm happy to say. I am glad to say. I'm on the right way. I am on the way. That leads from night to perfect day. It's joy to know. It's friend above. the privilege of visiting South India on a number of occasions during the last 20 years where we ministered to the students of the Bible College of Layman's Evangelical Fellowship in Chennai. Now here's a picture of us with some students uh, at the Bible College. We met some fine young men from Manipur in the far northeast of India who were training to be evangelists and pastors in their own state. Here's a photograph of some of them, uh, taken actually on my birthday celebration in 2014. This was our last visit to India. In Manipur, the main people are Manipuris. There are also many tribes. The Bible students in the photo are Manipuris, Cookies and Nagas. One of them gave us this DVD. It's called Beyond the Next Mountain. It is a film based on the life of Ruchunga Padayati from Manipur. It inspired me to tell you the story of how the gospel came to the Hmar tribe just over 100 years ago. They live in the mountainous area in South Manipur. The capital of Manipur is Imphal. The state is bounded by the Indian states of Nagaland to the north, Mizoram to the south and Assam to the west. It also borders two regions of Myanmar. On the 4th of February 1910, a young missionary just 22 years of age from Wales named Watkin Roberts, who had been saved in the Welsh revival of 1904, came to Manipur to reach the Mar tribe. They worshipped spirits, the mountains, rocks and rivers. Only a generation earlier, this tribe was reported to be among the fiercest head hunters in northeast India. In 1871, they beheaded over 500 tea plantation workers and some British soldiers. Roberts was refused permission to visit the tribe as they feared for his life. But he felt strongly that God wanted him to reach them with the gospel. So he decided to go alone without a permit. 
armed only with a copy of the New Testament. The Mar people accepted him and called him Mr. Young Man. He was able to explain the gospel to them. After a week of teaching, the chief and four other teenage Mar men, including Ruchunga's father, announced that they wanted to make peace with the God of the Bible by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. However, Roberts was expelled from India because he had stayed overnight in Hamar homes, where he also ate their food. He returned home to Wales, his hopes and dreams shattered. He had no idea what would become of the seed he had planted. Now, Rachunga Podiety, seen here in the photograph, was born into the Mar tribe on the 4th of December 1927. One day his father took him up one of the mountains near their home. As he pointed out the farthest mountain to him, he explained that it is called the Horizon. What do you think is beyond that, he asked? Another mountain. The horizon is always in front of you, beyond the next mountain. God's love is like a horizon, always there waiting for us, leading us on. Rachunga said he wanted to give his name to Jesus and follow him to the horizon. Changwa believed that his son was God's chosen instrument to bring the Bible to the entire Mar tribe in their own language. As the family prepared to send them on the long dangerous journey to the mission school, they prayed for his safety from wild animals. Ruchunga was a clever boy and soon he was teaching other children to read and write in English. He went on to study at St Paul's Cathedral Mission College in Kolkata and the University of Allahabad. He then received a scholarship to study Greek and Hebrew in Edinburgh, in Scotland, and from there he was given a place in Wheaton College, Illinois. In 1956, while he was at Wheaton, a letter came from none other than Mr. Watkin Roberts, or Mr. Youngman, who had visited his tribe in 1910, long before he was born. Ruchunga had heard so much about him from his father. He was living in Toronto and had heard that there was a young man from the Mar tribe studying at the college. Ruchunga flew to Toronto to meet him, now an elderly man. Here is a photograph of Watkins Roberts in later years. When Mr Roberts realised who his young visitor was, he exclaimed, what an amazing Christ who only asks us to believe that he is at work. To put one's life in his hands is not to be led astray. You are the first fruits of my ministry. Though Roberts had only spent five days with the Mars, the converts grew in faith and became leaders of a new energetic church. Within two generations, the entire Mar tribe had been evangelised. Headhunting stopped. Ruchunga shared with Roberts that there were now over 100 Mar churches. Some of his early converts were elders and leaders. He then sang in his native tongue. The light of eternity has shone in my heart and don't let me forget that I belong to you. In 1958, Ruchunga completed the translation of the New Testament from Greek into the Mar language. It was the culmination of three years of difficult study, working in hotels at night to support himself. The checking and editing work and printing took another two years. When the Mar New Testament was finally printed in 1960, the initial 5,000 copy run sold out 
within six months. Rachunga later made Bible translations for other tribal languages. He was married to Maui on the 1st of January 1959 in Manipur. Shortly after their wedding, they arrived in Chicago to begin their journey of faith together. God gave them men and women to serve on their mission board and people to support their ministry. Ru, as he came to be called, was named Executive Director of the Indo-Burma Pioneer Mission. In 1973, that ministry, which was then located in Wheaton, Illinois, became known as Bibles for the World. Today, it has its headquarters in Colorado. Dr. Podiety was responsible for translating the whole Bible into the Mar language and helping several other tribes translate the Bible into their languages. He and his organisation mailed Bibles individually wrapped and addressed to 19 million homes in 110 nations, including 1 million copies to the Soviet Union. Providing free Bibles where people had little or no access to the scriptures in their own language was one of Dr. Podiety's greatest accomplishments. For more than a half century, he spearheaded ministry outreaches that have touched tens, if not hundreds of millions of people across the globe. He also established 85 Christian day schools, seven high schools, two junior colleges as well as a seminary, a Christian hospital and a research centre. The Bataides also began a child and student sponsorship programme that has impacted tens of thousands of lives in India. In addition, they founded more than 350 churches. He went home to be with his Lord and Saviour. He faithfully served. On the 10th of October 2015, Age 88. Now, I'd like you to listen to a hymn, four verses of which were written by Mr. Watkin Roberts' wife, Gladys. It's Wounded for Me. It is sung by Calvary Free Presbyterian Church Choir.
So now you know why we had the song Telling the World. And that message and story that we have just listened to is surely an ongoing story telling the world. And not just through the ministry that Rachunga started, but of course through many agencies today. God's word is going out and praise the Lord for the medium that we're able to use today and the platform of Facebook and the internet and YouTube to get the message out through glad tidings are. We are just a very small cog in a very large wheel. There are many ambassadors of Jesus Christ who are using many different means to get the message that Jesus Christ came into the world to seek and to save that which was lost, to give to people in their own language the word of God. And of course we read, The entrance of thy word bringeth light. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And praise God today, we have a message worth telling. And thank God today, it's because of a Savior who was wounded for us, who is risen for us, who is ascended now and is interceding for us, and praise God, has promised to come again and receive his own to himself. What a glorious day that will be. Can you imagine meeting all these wonderful people who were brought from darkness to light and brought into the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ? What a glorious place heaven is going to be when we all get home. And it'll not be long, and Jesus is coming soon. I trust that you're ready, that you are truly saved, that you are born of the Spirit of God, and that He dwells within your heart, and you're living daily for Him, and watching and waiting and looking above, filled with His goodness and lost in His love. Well, just now I want to read to you from the Old Testament Scriptures, and I'm reading today from Jeremiah chapter 1, the opening verses of this great book, the book of Jeremiah, the prophet. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 1. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests that were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the carrying away of Jerusalem captive in the fifth month. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, this is Jeremiah speaking now, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. And by this time he was twenty years of age. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee. And whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See. I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. And now we're going to conclude our Bible reading there at verse 10 and pray that God will bless the reading to all our hearts for Christ's sake and glory. Now let's lift our hearts to the Lord in a moment of prayer. Father, we give thanks and praise today in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, for the glorious gospel of our blessed God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray today that as we continue with the program, the Holy Spirit will bless the word 
and speak into all our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, and for the glory of our Savior. Amen. I want to share with you today from the book of Jeremiah and to share with you for a little while about this amazing man, Jeremiah the prophet. I've given my message a title today, Jeremiah the Cross Bearer and the Crown Wearer. In those opening verses that we read a little while ago, we read these words. God says, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. The call of God on the life of Jeremiah was in the plan of God before he was born, and clearly presented to him as we have just read. Here was someone who was going to fulfill one of the greatest ministries in Old Testament times. And when I read a verse like that, it really pulls me up and really solemnizes my heart because there is no getting away from the fact that the unborn, yet in the womb infant, is known to God, precious to God, and sacred in his sight. These words from Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 4 and others that have a similar content in the Word of God highlight the value that God places upon the unborn child and, of course, highlights the heinousness of abortion. Let's not take away from the fact that this is the murder of innocent children. That should solemnize all our hearts that such a sacred life should be so callously snuffed out and disposed of is a crime for which there will be a day of reckoning. God will not allow this to go unjudged. That is for sure. But coming to the message again today, I wonder how many of you have noticed a particular emphasis or a thread of thought on glad tidings are since we entered this year. Now, I'm not going to tell you what that little common thread is, but if you think you've found it, why not let me know? And we'll see who is the most observant. Sometime I'll tell you in the next program or two, but I'm not going to tell you today, just to see if you're really focusing. So you might need to reflect on some of the programs that we've already given to you this year, right from the beginning of the year. So the introduction to Jeremiah is this, that he exercised his ministry between the years of 626 B.C. to 580 B.C. Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet because of his compassion for the people of Judah. But he's also known for the weeping prophet because of the hardships that he endured as a faithful messenger of the Lord. For over 40 years, he never once saw any grateful response. His grief was compounded when he saw his beloved people carried away captive into Babylon, and some of them to never return. Seventy long years of captivity in Babylon, and all those deportations between 604 and 586 B.C. Jeremiah lived through that. That's why I gave this message the title, Jeremiah the Crossbearer. But ultimately, he became the crown wearer. So let me focus for a little while on Jeremiah's cross. And first of all, his rejection. It was Dr. Alexander White who said, The loneliness of a man's heart among his own people is one of the heaviest crosses that any man has to take up. A casual reading of the life and ministry of this wonderful man of God leaves us with the distinct awareness that he was a much maligned man. For example, he was cursed 
and rebuked. In chapter 15, verse 10, he said, Woe is me, my mother, that thou hast borne me a man of strife and a man of contention to the whole earth. I have neither lent on usury, nor men have lent to me on usury. Yet every one of them doth curse me. He was beaten and put in stocks. In chapter 20, in verse 2, Then Pashur smote Jeremiah the prophet and put him in the stocks that were in the high gate of Benjamin, which was by the house of the Lord. Here he was, placed in a prominent place in the temple area. Why? Well, to add shame to his pain. And then to spend a whole night bent and twisted in the stocks after being beaten and bleeding. What pain! What agony! Poor Jeremiah, this lonely man, must have gone through. He was threatened with death. Chapter 26 and verse 8, The people took him, saying, Thou shalt surely die. On another occasion, the message that God had given him, when it was presented to King Jehoiakim, he cut it up with a penknife and he cast it into the fire. What a godless man and wretch he was. D. Whit Talmage, the famous preacher, preached a sermon on the reckless penknife based on this event. Jeremiah was charged with treason and imprisoned. Chapter 37, verses 11 to 15. Chapter 38, verse 6, he was cast into a horrible dungeon and only for a good and godly man who pulled him up again, Jeremiah would have been left to rot in the dungeon. He was taken against his will eventually to Egypt in chapter 43, verses 7 and 8. So for Jeremiah, the pathway of faithfulness was the way of reproach, of rejection, and of suffering. Even as I speak today, and even as you might think with me now, can you not see a striking identity between Jeremiah and our blessed Lord Jesus Christ? He too travelled the pathway of reproach, and rejection and suffering. The interpretation of Jeremiah's suffering is to be found in the suffering of our Saviour. And you remember, of course, that he also told his disciples to be prepared for the same experience. Jesus said to them, In the world ye shall have tribulation. Again he said, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Again he said to them, Marvel not if the world hate you. Ye know that it hated me before it hated you. And of course we realize that that's to be expected from an ungodly world. But we need to remember too that it was in the house of his own people his so-called friends, that Jesus was wounded. Where did you get those wounds? We read in the prophet Zechariah, whence did you find there get these wounds? These are the wounds with which I was wounded in the house of my friends, said the prophet. You know, we all find it difficult to cope with rejection. Maybe you have experienced that too. Jeremiah was no exception. In fact, he was so downcast at one period that he said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name. But he didn't stop at that point because he continues in chapter 20, verse 9, and says, But his word was in my heart as a burning fire, shut up in my bones, and I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. What devotion and fervor Jeremiah possessed. Yes, the path of rejection is the path that Jeremiah walked. It's the path our blessed Savior walked. And of course, he tells us that we should be prepared to walk that path as well. Yes, his cross, rejection. Jeremiah's cross, his submission, 
If ever a man was committed and submitted to bear reproach, it was Jeremiah. Yet there was no grumbling, there was no thought of playing truant, no notice of resignation for an easier road or a more popular ministry. In chapter 10 and verse 19, he says, Woe is me for my hurt. My wound is grievous. But I said, Truly this is a grief, and I must bear it. It was Henry Francis Light who penned a hymn, which we all have some recollection of, I'm sure. And it might well be applied to Jeremiah. Jesus, I my cross have taken, all to leave and follow thee, destitute, despised, forsaken, thou from hence my all shalt be. Perish every fond ambition, all I've sought and hoped and known, yet how rich is my condition. God and heaven are still my own. Hallelujah. Speaking about this submission and submissiveness to the cross, in that context I was reminded of the words of Dr. A.W. Tozer, speaking about a man on a cross, and he identified three areas regarding such a person. He said, he's facing in one direction, he has no thoughts of returning to his former life, and he has no future plans. Those three emphases are true, of course. For the vast majority, crucifixion or the cross was not accepted except in helpless resignation. They knew there was no way of escape. When they were condemned to die by crucifixion, they would be on a cross regardless of how they struggled or fought. There they would die. They knew that their fate was sealed, and the cross had only completed its work when its victim was dead. But for Jeremiah, Jesus, and us, the Calvary Road must be the way of submission, because we wouldn't have it any other way. He gladly embraced it, our Savior went all the way to Calvary. He set his face, says the Bible, like a flint to go to Jerusalem. He knew what was ahead of him, but nothing could deviate him. And, of course, Jeremiah too. He kept on 40 years of ministry and no encouragements along the way from any human standpoint or perspective. It was G. Campbell Morgan who said, in the story of Jeremiah's shrinking and pain and tears, we have a picture of a man in such perfect fellowship with God that through him God was able to reveal his own suffering in the presence of sin. I am reminded of the Apostle Paul as he was writing to the church at Colossae. He said this, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and I fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. We only need to reflect on the life that the Apostle Paul had and think about his sufferings, and here he is rejoicing in it and saying, What am I doing? I am filling up the sufferings, that which is behind, of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh. Who for? For his body's sake, which is the church. Jenny Moosey wrote a beautiful hymn, and you know it, and it's often uh, been sung at the breaking of bread at the Lord's table on the Lord's day in the Lord's house. King of my life, I crown thee now. Thine shall the glory be, lest I forget thy thorn-crowned brow. Lead me to Calvary. But in verse 4 of that hymn, she says this, May I be willing, Lord, to bear daily my cross 
for thee, even thy cup of grief to share. Thou hast borne all for me. Let's remember that there are many brothers and sisters of ours today in different nations, different countries around this world who are suffering as Jeremiah and experiencing something of the sufferings of rejection. And well, as you meet them, and if you ever did, you would find that they are gladly submitted to identifying with the Savior in his sufferings and in his cross, and they are bearing the cross with an inward joy, counting it a great honor to suffer shame for the name of Jesus. They do put us to shame. They really do. Well, there's one last thought today, and that is that Jeremiah had a crowning day. He didn't always live in this terrible experience of suffering and rejection and bearing a cross. I titled my message, The Cross Bearer and the Crown Wearer. In the final analysis, Jeremiah was not at the mercy of the rebellious crowd. God cared for Jeremiah in spite of his trials. He preserved Jeremiah's tears in a bottle. The Bible says, are they not written in a book? And yes, well, it's recorded in the book of Jeremiah, but God has kept a record of Jeremiah's tears. There came a day when his trials came to an end. Tradition tells us and records that Jeremiah died by stoning at the hands of his own people. If that is so, then he won a martyr's crown. And how do I know that he won a martyr's crown? If he died by stoning? Because God says, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. We read these words in the New Testament Scriptures, If we suffer with him, with the Lord Jesus. If we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. And then, of course, Jeremiah saw beyond the generations of his day. He was spurred on by the prophetic vision that reached all the way down the centuries, revealing the coming Messiah. And in Jeremiah chapter 23 and verse 6, we read about the Lord, the righteous branch and his name, Jehovah Sidkenu. What does that name mean? It means the Lord, our righteousness. There would be a virgin-born Savior. And he records, of course, that wonderful uh, phrase and sentence, The Lord hath created a new thing in the earth. A woman shall compass a man. And praise God, there came a day when in the womb of the Virgin Mary, our blessed Savior resided until the moment that he was birthed into this earth. And praise God today for the miraculous conception of our Savior and the glorious virgin birth of the same Savior in Bethlehem's manger, nine months after his conception. Here is one who would establish a kingdom, who would be the mediator of a new covenant, written not on tables of stone, but on the tables of the heart. And what is the meaning of all this? Well, this would be a covenant of grace, not of law, a covenant sealed by redeeming blood. And Jeremiah spoke about that. The precious blood of Jesus Christ would be the basis of the new covenant. And what about the promised one who has appeared? He has sealed that covenant in his own sacrifice on Calvary's cross. And salvation is offered to all who will believe and receive God's provided grace through Jesus Christ. God's law written in our hearts. His love planted within our souls. His blessed presence in our lives. Oh, what a covenant of grace this is. But Jeremiah saw beyond this age of grace too, to the kingdom of glory, when those who pierced Messiah shall look upon him and heal him as their eternal king, and his kingdom shall know no end. He must reign, 
and those who, like Jeremiah, have borne the cross of reproach and suffering in life will reign with Messiah. In conclusion, it could be said that there is no one in the Bible who comes nearer to expressing the sorrowing, patient, gracious love of Jesus Christ in his mission of salvation than Jeremiah. And secondly, who is there today of us called to ministry who could read the story of Jeremiah without a sense of inward self-rebuke that we fall so far short of his meek, brave, brokenness of spirit? Oh, may the Lord write his word in all our hearts today and help us to identify with our Savior. Teach me, O Lord, to serve as thou deservest, to give and not to count the cost, to fight and not to heed the wounds, to toil and not to seek for rest, to labor and not to ask for reward. Oh, may the Lord help us today as his people to embrace the cross and one day we shall wear the crown. But only if we have trusted in the Savior, only if we have come to the cross as repentant sinners and embrace salvation offered through the finished work of the cross, then as we travel with the Savior, remember that in all our tribulations, He will be with us. He will not fail us. He will be there. And one day we shall reign with Him. May God bless His word to our hearts. Now we're going to listen to a lovely song. And the song is, Am I a soldier of the cross? And think about the question and apply it to your heart. A follower of the Lamb. And shall I fear to own his cause or blush to speak his name? Here we go with the song. Thank you so much for staying with us. Thank you again for all the ministry that we have enjoyed today. Dear Lord, we give you praise and we thank you, our dear friends, today. God bless you. Keep sharing. Keep subscribing to our YouTube channel and keep on telling others. And may the Lord make us all uh, ambassadors for Jesus, telling the world whose we are and whom we serve and counting not the cost. 
God bless you each one. Eric Stewart saying, bye-bye again. <music>